So I'm going to bring the chat up and put that over on the uh, my other monitor, just in case there's chat that's relevant. Okay. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Jacqueline. Welcome. You are muted, Karen. Sorry. <laughs> I said good morning. <laughs> Uh, where are you from and what do you do? I um, work for I work for Cornell Crop Extension of Jefferson County. I work for a Healthy Families um, program. I'm a family educator, and I'm also a Bridges Out of Poverty Life Certified Trainer. Perfect. Jefferson oh. County, Ohio. What what state? Wa Watertown, New York. New York. Okay. Watertown. There's there's a lot of Jefferson counties, that's for sure. Yeah, I tried to make you a Buckeye. <laughs> well, Watertown has good stuff going on. Yeah. So Phil, I have a lot of people that um, want to become certified again. Are we going to ever be able to do one of those trainings again? I have a lot of people that missed our certification that you did here, like, I don't know, five years ago in Watertown. Uh, well, do you want to do it in person or do you want to do it virtually? I don't know. I just know I have a, a friend that used to work at our urban mission. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's where Don Cole is now the director. Yeah. And now he's working for VAC. Mm -hmm. um, he really wants to be a certified trainer. He's really, he believes in it like I do much. Like I do it on my own time, unless I'm doing it for Cornell. Mm -hmm. I've done it. I did it a virtual one this during COVID for um, our um, um, resolution center. I didn't like it, but yeah. I did it. <laughs> well, I'm sure we can work something out. They, I just know a yeah. lot of people that say, I want to be trained in that. I want to be trained in that. Super. You know, we, cool. offer, we offer online certifi certified trainings. I, have, I haven't seen it in the emails. Um, yeah, we just sent one out again this morning, but it, we have one starting in October. I saw that the, the, the thing in Texas and that I didn't see, and then the stuff we could take for free if we were life certified but I didn't see anything about of course I didn't check my email real careful this morning I had a meeting at eight and I was off yesterday so yeah so yes if he's interested um, you can go on to ahaprocess.com the events and we'll start October 6th with oh, an okay. online it's five sessions I'll let him know and right. I also want to let you know I've had two families take the getting ahead program and how impactful it has been with them they after they take it they're like they're like all ready to go they got all this fire underneath them That's i love great. that program well, yeah and yeah. you guys have done some really creative things in support of the getting head graduates yeah Irvin mission has they've been doing a great job with it yeah yeah don really believes in it she really you know when she was over at capc the community actions and now she's at Irvin mission well, we welcome everybody and we would like for you to find the chat, put in your, your name, where you're from, what you do. Um, and we will get started here in about seven minutes. So thank you for joining today. So while we're waiting, uh, Phil, there was, I was, one of the things that we emailed with some folks on your team was the work with the ACEs. Um, yeah. What's the status of that? Is that? We, uh, we have a supplement that goes with getting ahead uh, that uh, introduces ACEs. Sorry. And uh, yeah, it, it's a matter of becoming certified to do it. So there's a, a very short certification. Once you're getting head facilitator, you can become a a person that facilitates ACEs as well. So is it a supplement in terms of like an ebook that goes out or is it an actual another? There, there's a, uh, there's a, a small manual that goes with it and also, a facilitator guide. So when the people are going through the training, it's an extra little module in the training. Mm -hmm. That's okay. right. Well, with all the things going on, uh, there's no, no shortage of trauma and toxic stress. <laughs> I just, my heart goes out to the, the folks down in Louisiana and it's mm -hmm. just 
and now they're saying it's going to be so sweltering hot with no electricity not yeah, not an enviable position yeah but it's gonna be it's gonna be really hard for a long time down there yeah welcome gene krabs hello and i'm putting myself right away on mute just wanted to say hello be sociable i'm still i've not read my book on zoom etiquette yet so i'm not sure how all this is supposed to work but i'm going to put myself on mute now. okay tell us who you are in chat what you do uh, you know that's that that's a whole book yeah <laughs> All right. Okay. So have you guys read the um what happened to you book with Dr. Perry? I have not. I've not read it. We're doing a book club with healthy families right now. It, um really interesting. He's um done two talks with us already. So is it more on a practical way to kind of have an aces? informed conversations or what's the the idea what's the concept of the book the audio book is actually i guess the best but i didn't buy the audio book i i should have i guess but i still have it free through my amazon order but um it's a conversation between him and oprah winfrey oh wow yep so it's about her experiences and how she's healed and talking about the brain how the brain is affected by aces and trauma and stuff and it's really it, the book is really easy read too but i guess they have it virtual i'm just not a big virtual book reader right. you know or, or... there's an outstanding documentary that i just watched i think it's called young brains um but it, it's really good in terms of just the importance of that early brain development and the different things that impact it positively or negatively. Um, I have to pull up the, the exact title of it, but I just kind of came across that it was recommended in my my YouTube, you know, kind of feed. And I was so it's on it's on YouTube. Yeah, so it's available for free um, as an hour long documentary, and like I said, I was really impressed with it. There's quite a few. There's that spared the child. There's quite a few that we've watched. Mm -hmm. I can't remember all of them, but um, I'm an ACES junkie. Yeah. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Cameron. Welcome. Hello, Kirk. Ruth. I'm sorry, Kirk, not Kirk Cameron. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Yeah. We're going to ask you to put your name, um, where you're from, and what you do in the chat. And we're going to get started here in two minutes. And when that happens, we want you to turn your um, audio off if you aren't going to be presenting. And then we can turn it back on later for Q&A. So the, the documentary, it's called Brain Matters. M-A-T-T-E-R-S. And in YouTube, it's Brain Matters Documentary. But I'm, it's something I'm going to be recommending for a lot of our communities that we work with around ACEs and trauma to do an early childhood development and ready for K to sort of do watch parties and Zoom discussions and different ways to, to get people to watch that. Because I think it does an excellent job of really showing how important it is that we as a, as a society really um, do the things that help the early brain development and that helps everybody in the long run.
Brain Matters documentary. Good morning, Joe. We'll get started here at the top of the hour. We welcome everybody to this um, discussion about housing. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, this is Ruth Weirich and I wanna welcome you to our webinar series. Sometimes we do them recorded and today we're doing it live. We have Bill Barberg and Phil Duvall. Uh, Bill concentrates on housing solutions in his organization. And so it's a timely, timely, um, a time for us to have this discussion around housing. So Bill, I'm going to hand it off to you and Phil. All right, thank you very much. Well, we titled this webinar, Building Bridges for Solutions to the Housing Crisis. And ever since I first read uh, Ruby Payne's work and, and the whole bridges and getting ahead work, I felt that it is such a valuable thing to bring to communities that are tackling complex issues around community level issues around poverty and housing and, and things that my consulting and technology company works with. And so I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to have Phil present at the Housing Solution Summit and then begin to, to combine some of the information that we each bring. So I'm gonna just quick go over to our agenda today, some of the topics we'll cover and then turn it over to Phil to get started with the content. So Phil's gonna briefly talk about the, the urgency and the need for innovations to address the housing crisis and again, his perspective on the value of bridging the, the bridges world and the housing solution summit that I've organized. And also the importance of, of building common ground solutions in a very kind of partisan and politically and ideologically divided country. There's a lot of things that should make sense to pretty much everyone. A lot of what my company brings to communities is a system thinking and a strategy management kind of system leadership approach to build and align many different efforts on these sorts of complex issues and, and build bridges between the silos. And then most of the time is gonna be spent giving you some samples and previews of content from the Housing Solution Summit which I've noted here is building bridges to a brighter future as we work together to have practical solutions to the many challenges of the housing crisis. So we'll have some times where you can, you can be typing questions into the chat and I may, we may try to answer those in, in the flow of things. And we'll try to have a little bit of time at the end and we, we should go about uh, just maybe 45 or 50 minutes for this webinar. So Phil, why don't you start? All right, well, thanks Bill. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, I think you know me for the books that you see on the, the screen there. And I think most of the people in this webinar are people that have, are familiar with Bridges already. Um, so when the COVID pandemic uh, closed down businesses, it uh, kicked off uh, a housing crisis for low wage workers and, and people in, in poverty. Uh, so we were paying attention and holding uh, Zoom meetings with uh, people in bridges communities across the country and you know talking about evictions and finding out who was doing what and getting sort of some of the best practices out there but um things have changed and we're now facing an avalanche of evictions and this is because uh on august 26th the supreme court ended um uh, the moratorium on evictions so hundreds of thousands of people are gonna lose shelter. In addition to that, to the Supreme Court decision, uh, there have been delays in the emergency rental assist assistant, uh, assistance at uh, the state and rural levels. In other words, that's where the problem is. So here's a story on how that, that came about. 
6.2 million households owe $17 billion in back rent. Now the feds allocated $46 billion for rent, but only 5 billion of that went to people, right? And by the end of July. So that has to do with problems at the state and rural and uh, local levels. You wanna keep that in mind. So the bottom line is many people are gonna become homeless for the first time. And the police are gonna be busy in the fall going around evicting people from their homes. So we're really facing this avalanche of evictions. Uh, there's another problem too, and that's for people that uh, are able to stay in their housing, but they're being squeezed to pay more and more to avoid eviction. And there's this phenomenon of uh, distance investigators. I mean, sorry, distance investors. You can tell where my mind is, um, who are buying up apartments and houses. And uh, that's not gonna lower the price, of course, uh, of housing. And it's not gonna be good for your local economy. So this webinar is about finding solutions for the people that we've been working with all along and that we know so well that are going through getting ahead and we know them in our communities. So we're recommending that you build a bridge and you know we, we're overusing this word bridge, I'm sure, <laughs> between what uh, Bill is doing and what we're doing. And the, um, you're gonna hear more from Bill. You're gonna love that kind of detailed information they have. Uh, Mike Dames and I have had the opportunity to speak at one of the summits the housing solution summits that Bill mentions. And I've sat in on the follow-up uh, sessions that are called deep dive days. And I was so impressed by what I was hearing. Uh, the, the solutions are so concrete and creative. Uh, the ideas are just flying around. So there's, there's no need for those of us in Bridges communities to try to reinvent things. We've got a potential partner here that we can work with beautifully and learn a lot from. So that's really why uh, Bill and I and our organizations are kind of fans of one another. And you know we're bringing really concrete and creative solutions, but what we have is between us is very different and needed uh, strengths for dealing with housing uh, issues. And so you know we bring this all together and we've got an opportunity to do some really wonderful things. The, uh, the things that we can bring to it, uh, those of you that are familiar with Bridges, is that we're really good at bringing people across um, class, race, sectors, and political persuasions. All those lines get crossed in Bridges communities. And we're really able to focus on, instead of our disagreements, we can work on our shared concerns. And that's one of our strong suits in the Bridges work. So uh, by working together, uh, bridges communities and the housing solutions folks, we might be able to uh, create some kind of a model. I mean, if you think big and into the future, and I think, think about that while you're hearing what Bill is gonna tell you about in the next few minutes. So Bill, let me turn it back to you and uh, take us on a journey there. All right, sounds good. Well, um... When one of the, the key challenges that, that we see in many different issues dealing with poverty, housing, addiction, chronic disease, is that there's so much fragmentation in efforts to try to help address these issues. And when you've got so many different organizations that are working independently, often competing against each other, it really makes it harder to, to solve problems, even though we have a lot of the resources and tools to do that. And so a big part of what I've helped focus, help communities work on is developing a shared strategy that they can begin to co-align around. And we say there's different levels of collaboration, but just having a framework around these are the different drivers that we're trying to address. And here's who's working on which ones and how we can help accomplish that goes a long way. And I was recruited to write a chapter on the book shown here. This is the book is Solving Population Health Problems Through Collaboration. And I wrote a pretty lengthy chapter on implementing population health strategies 
that go into the detail, the practical details of how you, you begin to bring people together instead of them all just working in their own little world. And with the Housing Solutions Summit, we have, we have what we call an all access pass that I'll share about, but we have an e-learning course, we have multiple sessions and, and actually the last deep dive day goes into a lot of these practices for how city governments, businesses, the hospitals, the faith communities and other stakeholders can start to be part of a larger team to really address these, these complex issues. And much like bridges and getting ahead, it, it supports collaboration by introducing in many ways a new way of thinking and new concepts, but also a common language that can bring people together. We do that, at, but at a different level. We talk about strategy maps and from two gaps and, and how we can help not launch new programs, but find ways to assist efforts that are already underway as a faster way to get more benefit for fewer resources. So we're addressing these things in different ways. And that's why I think there's such potential to work together. So the, the Housing Solutions Summit came about, uh, I started the Population Health Learning Collaborative about three years ago to just bring together people so we could learn from each other. And we did a survey in 2019 and said, what issue is the toughest issue for people working on population health, whether they're with health departments or hospitals or Medicaid, you know, what, what is the real challenging issue? And the top one cluster of them involved housing, the cost of housing, housing instability, homelessness. And they just felt that was such a, a serious threat and they didn't know how to deal with it. And I've been working in this space long enough to know that there's a lot of really innovative and valuable solutions out there. So we started a solution summit focused on innovations in 2020. And that's led to a series of events that we do online called, we now just call them collectively the Housing Solution Summit. But they're all focused on solutions where we wanna find promising innovations that could be replicated and then it could be combined because you might have a great idea coming with, from Portland, Maine that can be combined with another great idea from Portland, Oregon, combined with some technology from Nashville and a model that might be pioneered in Austin, Texas. And as they learn from each other, they can get even stronger. And I think the bridges and getting ahead concepts help in that bigger system of combining good ideas. And we really like to focus on things that can be replicated, that are economically feasible, that, are, that make the most of underutilized assets and what we call abundant and multiplying resources. Things that the more you share them and the more you use them, the better they get. So we're doing in the middle now of a series of five deep dive days. And each one of these has about 25 or so sessions. Most of them are 25 minutes that go into the details of Tell me in depth how you're doing certain things. In some cases, it's a little more of an introduction, but it's really a rich set of information on many different ways of preventing and dealing with homelessness, rapidly expanding the housing supply with an emphasis on home sharing, increasing a housing supply with accessory dwelling units, a whole bunch of innovations on housing finance and ownership innovations. And then the last one is on some of these techniques of how do you put together a multifaceted strategy. And this is where we think a lot of the good work that you've done with the Bridges communities on the things that are sort of your sweet spot could be expanded to bring in more people or leverage those relationships with more tools and be able to manage a um, greater set of suite of, of strategies for addressing the housing crisis. So what I'm gonna do is give you a little sampling of, of four of the five deep dive days, just so you get a sense of that. And you'll get, you get a sense of the fifth one through that. Because all of these are available with the full sets of recordings. Um, and what we're looking for, as you'll see at the end, is for communities to come together ideally and say, we wanna get an all community, all access pass. So we have all of this material that we can use and share and tap on shoulders. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So the first deep dive date was focused on homelessness. And one of the things that we, we looked at was the huge need for this invisible population of people who are technically homeless, but living in their cars. And when there's unfortunately probably gonna be hundreds of thousands of people evicted, many of them 
have jobs, they have cars, they just couldn't afford their housing, so they'll be living in their cars. And so I want to give you just a four minute little sample that will show a little bit about that particular um, session. So I'm going to share my video here with Colin DeForest. And one, I just like to say every time I get on here, it's, it's exciting and such a great opportunity to hear what people are doing around the country. So far, I'm just scribbling notes over here trying to write down stuff that I'm learning. So I hope everyone's enjoying it and getting as much as I am getting out of it. Um, the last webinar, I talked about a safe parking network, which is a strategic partnership with faith-based organizations. I wish that I could make it seem like some amazingly innovative program, but truly what it is, it was really trying to strategically engage faith-based organizations to really see what do we have as assets to bring to the table. Oftentimes what we heard was, we're very interested in partnering, but we just, we're, we feel overwhelmed by homelessness just as a whole in general. So what the Safe Parking Network does is it really provides an umbrella, a fiscal umbrella, which is obviously incentivizes faith-based organizations to come forward. So we provide funding for some of the basic amenities like portable toilets, hand washing stations, garbage services, lighting, cameras. To, we try to put as much power into our faith-based partner as possible and really say, one, who do you want to serve, right? But it's, it's truly finding out what do you need to take this next, next step? Is it financial? Because if it's that, we can definitely move in that direction. Is it really supportive services? Like you're, you have the parking lot. So once again, it's talking about, as was talked about earlier, what, what assets is your congregation, your faith-based organization bringing to the table? Well, we have this giant parking lot and with COVID, we are not using it. So on a temporary basis, we think maybe we could use this, but our numbers are really low and we have a lot of seniors and they don't think that they're probably not the best candidates to participate in a volunteer really one-on-one -on -one site engagement level. So, okay, well, so now we have identified what your assets are. For other churches, it's quite the opposite. We're young, we have um, a very active population, but we don't have any parking lots. So really what we're doing is we're trying to, to really identify who has what within the community and then bring those partnerships together and really begin to draw the lines of connectivity through our system. Home, the homeless service system is like another language. I'll always say that. It's, if you're in it, you get it. But if, if you're not in it, it's a lot of acronyms. It's a lot of scratching your head. It's a lot of trying to keep up. And that can be scary, right? So I really, so much of this is really connecting these faith-based organizations to homeless services and social service organizations that they may know of, but really giving them the, the grace and the ability to, to learn together and be supportive. It's a really exciting program. Honestly, people living in their vehicles are truly a invisible population of the homeless population. Um, you have families in their vehicles who are really trying to hide out. You have individuals in their vehicles. You have couples in their vehicles. You have a little bit of everyone. And episodically, you also have a lot of individuals that are fresh into and may not even identify themselves as really being homeless at that point. The ultimate goal is engage, engage individuals, give them a safe place to be, a safe place to stay for a, a short amount of time, and then as quickly as we possibly can, let's get them out of that vehicle and back into housing. And we've been very successful with doing that. Many of the individuals that we're serving, we're finding are, they're working, they're living in their vehicle and working. Um, lastly, I would say, Later this week, I have a presentation to a president of a, a community college in our area who we're just we're taking the final steps. I'm going to touch some wood to secure a partnership with them and multiple faith based organizations. Once again, again, coming with different skill sets, not necessarily the parking lot, but to support this partnership with a community college to serve students living in their vehicles at that college, which I, th I think is an amazing model that is probably happening all around this country. And I think if we can support those students living in their vehicles, talk about resiliency, right? Like if we can support those students at that time and really do what we can do to get them into some sort of housing, I think it'll be extremely successful. So that was uh, cutting out or trimming from an hour long session that went into a lot of detail into just some of you know, the, the kinds of innovative things that can be done. And 
What I want to share next is a technique that we use to help support that. And we're, we're working with Colin and his consulting group to really build out the details and make it much easier for communities to get these safe parking networks in place. And this is a little sample of a strategy map where as a community, you would be measuring and tracking and working to bring about multiple things to expand a safe parking network so you can increase people who avoid homelessness or, or end homelessness by transitioning back to, to housing. And so there's several things to make this successful. One is engaging faith communities to support people living in vehicles. And as Colin said, different ones bring different assets. Some might say, hey, we can bring breakfast out so people can leave and go off and get, you know, go off to work with a safe or with a full stomach, or we others that might be assisting with their work to develop individual success planning. And there's great programs to help people who are in crisis develop a pathway of what things do they need to get back on track. There's different things about outreach to people who are about to be evicted or, or who are living in their vehicles. Because that one week before you get evicted and the three weeks after, that month will have a huge impact on the rest of your life. Whether you lose all your possessions, lose your car, end up with all this trauma, or whether with some care and compassion, you can kind of minimize that, that trauma and get back into housing in 30 or 60 days. Then there's a whole replicating a set of guidelines and supports and how to do things and the frequently asked questions and the paperwork that doesn't have to be reinvented for every community. And then improving what might be in place for resource uh, directories, referral and community care coordination so that people who are needing to use that safe car parking have um, quick access to the resources to, to get back on track. So behind each one of these, we then help the communities figure out what's the current state, what's the desired state. And so this is some of the process we bring that I think can really enhance community collaboration. So that was our little sample from deep dive day number one. We have recordings of all of these sessions um, that are, are really inspiring of what communities have done to help address uh, uh, homelessness or evictions. Uh, so that's a little sample of deep dive day number one. So if one of the things you can do, if you have questions, I can't guarantee we'll get time for all of them, but you can type them in the chat. All right, uh, deep dive day number two. Uh, this was um, also done, this was in August, we've completed it. But here we were dealing with the, the real need for um, increasing the supply of housing that is affordable. And it, we had a whole bunch of sessions in this deep dive day that focused largely on different models of home sharing. Because if you take an example of, a, of King County, which is where Seattle is, They've had a huge housing shortage, a, a huge shop shortage of affordable housing and a huge problem with homelessness. But yet there are 140,000 homes with unused bedrooms owned by people over age 50. So you have a lot of these empty nesters and the number of those empty bedrooms is growing. So the question is, how do you leverage those? How do you make the most of those? And I'm an empty nester and when my uh, daughter went off to college, we decided we would rent out a room. And one of the people we rented to for a few months was James. He was a recent college grad and it was a good deal for him. He saved money and he had use of, of a house and could you know, borrow our bike and different things. And it was a win-win for us because it helped pay some of our mortgage. Well, when we started doing it, it was money we put towards our daughter's um, college education. And we then have also just used it to help pay down the bills. <laughs> So if you think about that, it's not saying that you, you put the homeless person in a person's bedroom, but it's a matter of increasing the supply. So if you have all of these houses with empty bedrooms, you may have different people that move in. A graduate student might move in with a, an older single or a couple that might need help paying their mortgage or their taxes, but it's a win-win. A teacher who can't afford to live in the neighborhood where the school is, so she's having to commute, you know, a long distance might move in with someone and, and help them with their retirement money with the amount that she pays that's still affordable. 
or maybe a community health worker that gives somebody else money they can use to travel or seniors getting together to reduce isolation because that's a, a huge problem and you have people living alone in three bedroom homes when that could be combined. But each time someone moves into one of those bedrooms, they're not taking up an economical apartment. And that can allow other people who have lower incomes to have access to those apartments. And for the people who are experiencing homelessness, they might first need a care team and social supports, helping them get stabilized in some sort of transitional housing. And where appropriate, at least now they have opportunities to move into a more affordable place. And all of this extra housing really has very modest costs. You don't have the, the limitations of lumber, labor, and land that they always say it makes it hard to increase the housing supply because you're just better using the existing housing supply. So that's a little example from the uh, deep dive day number two. And our speakers included authors and very uh, successful programs that have done amazing things. And again, a whole series of topics such as exchanging household help for home sharing, or um, the economic case for focusing on the housing supply, or using case management to proactively manage issues. And a, again, a strategy map template for shared housing. So again, lots of sessions to choose from. So deep dive day number three focused also on increasing the housing supply. Because if you don't increase the housing supply, if you just say we're going to have more rent vouchers, we're going to have more down payment support, we're going to have lower interest rates, whatever, all you do is you have the more people competing to buy the same houses, that drives up the price. If there's more people desperately needing rental properties and they pay more, that means rental properties become more profitable. So investors buy them up and raise the rent. So if you don't deal with the housing supply, all of the other resources really don't solve the problem. Now supply alone doesn't solve it, but it's, it's one of the most important things. And so that's why we had two days focusing on how communities could do that. And the deep dive day number three, which is one we're hoping you can rally some of your community partners to participate in, focuses primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on accessory dwelling units, uh, but also expanding single family homes to duplexes and the zoning and other things. It's not a trivial thing to do, but it's a, it's a wonderful solution. And this happens to be kind of the Google aerial view of a neighborhood uh, just a couple miles from where I live. And it's fairly typical from a lot of the neighborhoods that were built in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s where if you see here, we have the street, North Sheraton, and over here we have Russell. And in the middle is an alley. And so all of these houses face the streets. They've got their front, there's the sidewalk in front of the street. There's the sidewalk going out to the street. And the houses are closer. The front yards are relatively small as they face the street. And then you have all of these long, narrow backyards. And a lot of them have garages, um, and uh, they're largely underutilized. They're parking, garbage cans, but these are properties that could benefit from having an ADU in the backyard. Many of them, they'll build a big storage shed. Well, you can have an accessory dwelling unit, essentially like a, a 400 or so 500 square foot backyard cottage. And that can be rented out. There's a lot of different ways you can do that or you can replace a garage with a garage that has an apartment up above it. So you still have two or three cars of parking, but you have an additional housing unit. And this is good, it, it much cheaper, much less negative impact on the environment and the climate because you're keeping people where closer in, it's not urban sprawl, you're making good use of existing streets and water and sewer. And we actually go into 18 different models where that can work. And one of those, just to give an example, is if you have an older person in say a three bedroom home, very common, you add a $90,000 accessory dwelling unit. So for the cost of that $90,000 dwelling unit, you now free up this home to rent out to someone 
but it's owned still by an, a local person, not by a distant landlord from Los Angeles or Hong Kong or Saudi Arabia. It's owned by a local person so that rent money stays in the community. The owner is now living in a brand new senior friendly accessory dwelling unit in her own neighborhood. She can kind of keep, keep tabs on the, on the house, but may have a nonprofit helping them with the rental details. And in this gain sharing program, the, the people who are the renters could have an agreement that if they help with doing property upgrades and, and help with some renovations, which they could be supported by the broader community, they can actually begin kind of earning sweat equity towards a down payment or do a rent to own over time. So it gives them a pathway from renting to home ownership which works out in everyone's best interest. The appreciation, if the home value or the neighborhood gets better, that wealth goes to the owner and the renter and it stays in the neighborhood rather than going to some distant investor. The city gets more economic value and taxes to help uh, pay for their infrastructure. You're reducing carbon emissions, you're reducing transportation time and traffic because these are in this, the city where you tend to have more jobs and stuff and the neighborhood is enhanced because you have ownership. Now, Bill, could I interrupt just a second? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so I live in a, in a township that isn't zoned. Uh -huh. And we're literally working on zoning right now. Now, the kind of things you're talking about, zoning has to be a part of adding these dwellings. So what do you do? Yeah, so to do this in this ideal manner, it takes a bunch of things. This, what I just shared is illegal in most cities, but it shouldn't be. And there's a new bill working its way through both the Congress, both the House and the Senate called the Housing Supply and Affordability Act, which is providing, if, and it should pass, it has bipartisan support in both, both the House and Senate, provide money to local governments so they can fix their zoning. Because a lot of the zoning was done in the 50s, 60s, and 70s as a way to essentially keep people of color out of neighborhoods and to keep poor people you know, in poor neighborhoods. And I think most people recognize that's not a good thing. There is part of the, the challenge, though, is, is navigating the, the neighborhood politics of that. But this type of scenario works really well. And that's why we have a strategy map. The strategy map lays out all of the different things that you would ideally do to create a thriving ADU, accessory dwelling unit ecosystem. And we go through all of the many benefits, how it's increasing income for the homeowners, increased wealth building opportunities, increasing the supply of small affordable rental units and increase good housing options for seniors. And in the deep dive day, we go through 18 different scenarios. And we actually do that in the free webinar that you can, I'll show you in a moment. But to, to make that happen, there's the need to improve awareness and understanding of ADUs, address the zoning and code issues and parking requirements and building setback and all these other things that cities have put in place, but they can change. There's a whole bunch of things to reduce the cost of building ADUs to improve the financing and funding options for ADUs. And if you're going to have, say, a senior that's going to suddenly be a landlord for her, or her home or a person who's going to have a renter in the backyard in their ADU, there's support that can streamline that so they don't have to be the property management firm. They're just providing the space. And also the ability to build in telehealth and assisted living support services, because we're going to have a huge need for housing for an aging population. And rather than put them into congregate living facilities, where my dad went in March of 2020, and I couldn't visit him in person for a year, these type of distributed assisted living can be done with the support of telehealth and with nonprofits, but have people in their own, um, own little unit. And again, there's ways you can balance the social connection uh, with um, more options, but it lets gives more options for people to age in place in their neighborhood. So you don't have to do all of these things, but the more of these things that are done, 
And within many of these, we've got a plus that we can zoom in and say there's lots of different ways to reduce the cost of building ADUs. And we have sessions to show examples of many of these things. So it can feel a little overwhelming, but the good news is there are all of these practical things that can be done that can really help address the housing crisis in a way that builds the neighborhoods, the local economies. But they won't happen if you don't do a lot, if a community doesn't come together and say, here's our strategy. Let's make sure everyone's on board with it, or at least the vast majority of people, because it builds ownership, local wealth. It, it, it has many benefits if people understand. And again, so we have many different sessions, how suburban upzoning and densification can benefit everyone. Um, you know, a strategy map, what I just showed you, going into the details of that. Different examples of school programs that are building accessory dwelling units, managing local opposition, um, financial innovations, and there's just a, so many great sessions that we have in Deep Dive Day number three coming up on September 21st. Um, deep Dive Day number four has innovations in housing finance and ownership models. And this is coming up on October 19th. And we have a webinar, but roughly one month before each of these sessions, we do a webinar that goes into more of the details. Um, so that's coming up on September 23rd. Uh, but I wanna show a little quick, this is just a 90 second video on resident owned communities. Um, dealing with, with manufactured housing communities or what they used to call mobile home parks or trailer parks. And this is an example of a model that's been replicated over 280 times in, across the country in a 100% success rate. If you're like most people who own a home in a manufactured home community, you don't actually own the land underneath. This exposes you to potential rent increases year after year, with lot fees going towards someone else's profit. You might even lose your right to live there if your community gets sold for redevelopment, and you may have few or no viable options. And that's exactly why hundreds of communities are turning to a proven model of land ownership, resident-owned communities. That's where residents purchase their communities at fair market value, becoming the new owners through what's called a co-op or cooperative structure. They make decisions through their membership and an elected board of directors. Residents also set their own lot fees and put revenues back into community improvements. In fact, resident-owned communities are proven to increase lot fees at far lower rates than commercially-owned communities. Learn more and take the first steps toward turning your neighborhood into a resident-owned community with Rock USA and its national network. Rock USA, making resident ownership a reality nationwide. So there are millions of people in the United States that are at risk of losing their housing because investors are buying up um, these manufactured housing communities and raising the lot rents again and again. Hi, my name is Paul Bradley and I'm the president of Rock USA. Rock That's another one of the videos. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what I'm going to show next is another little segment of one of the sessions that we're going to be doing in uh, this deep dive day number four. This is the last one we'll, we'll look at. Okay. Can I just interject something? Bill? Yeah. Okay. I'm just sitting here grinning like from ear to ear. You know, I get so fired up about these things. I just keep imagining what it would be like for getting ahead investigators and graduates to sit around and learn this and have all these ideas put out there that are just not common. And I wonder if, you know, all the rest of you on this uh, webinar are, are thinking the same thing. I, we, we really need to make this information available to getting ahead investigators and graduates, because I think they would put the fire under us to do something about it. So Bill, that's my little sermon, go ahead. Okay. I had to say it. <laughs> All right. So this is a little uh, segment here that talks yeah, about how heavy lifting of bringing the residents together, educating them, getting the financing and a lot of the other work. And they're gonna be sharing about that in a free 
online presentation that's part of the Innovations in Affordable Housing Summit, a virtual summit that will be done this August, and you can learn more at improvepophealth.org. But this story shares a little bit about some of the things behind the scenes after they acquired the property that really helped create a more unique and successful community. I first visited a Park Plaza Cooperative annual meeting in 2015, and I was surprised to see that one of the presenters was U.S. Congressman Keith Ellison, who is now the Minnesota Attorney General. After that meeting, I met and talked with the board and shared about some of the things we had done in Detroit to help build a thriving community in apartment complexes, and we said, let's try some of those things here in Park Plaza. So we began to develop a strategy map, which is one of the tools we use. And we picked four things that were important outcomes. Improving the value of the property in the cooperative, improving the community resilience, improving the health of the residents, and building positive relationships in the community. Now, each one of these had several other objectives that we discussed that might take several years to accomplish, but one of the priorities to enhance the outside environment was to develop a playground for the kids. And for developing the community facilities, a priority was the storm shelter. When it came to improving community resilience, they recognized that there were a lot of community supports and resources that they and their residents weren't taking advantage of. So we wanted to help them increase utilization of community supports and resources. We also talked about expanding walking, hiking, and biking clubs or other programs, including bringing access to the mobile health clinic that was provided on site to the residents. For building positive relationships, one of the things we talked about was expanding the gardening club and having community meals. Well, this led to the initial planning and trying to bring in community partners. The first thing we did was plan a Christmas caroling night. And a group of volunteers from the Two Cities Church came over and kicked off a Christmas caroling that then went from home to home inviting people to listen and then join us. And it was requested that everyone come back the following year, which we also did. But from there, we really wanted to help people get involved in planning. So it was their vision. They owned the manufactured housing community, but they weren't taking full advantage of coming together to make it thrive. So the Fridley American Legion Hall, which was right across the street, donated the space for us to put on a dreaming and activity fair. And we reached out to numerous nonprofit and local government organizations that would have products or services that would help people living in Park Plaza and allowed them to set up a table for free and just share what they had. And we invited the residents to come over. We had different activities for the kids where local nonprofits that had arts activities came and they were able to provide their services and create an enjoyable event for the families. Different community organizations would bring their resources. We even had a place where people could record their stories as part of the event. People were able to make suggestions and think about what was possible and also think about the talents that they had that they could bring to help bring that event together. And one of the things we began planning was a fifth year anniversary for the acquisition of the property. And at that event, we planned a bunch of activities for the kids. It was a big potluck event. So many different people brought some of their favorite foods. And it really was a, a symbol of building more of the, the momentum going forward. NPR actually had someone there doing a story and that was a, ended up being a great feature story on NPR. And you can access that at this link, or you can visit the Park Plaza Co-op at this link. In the months that followed, we began looking for ways to bring those aspirations on the strategy map into reality. And we looked and found that there was a simple grant program for doing small community gardens called Garden in a Box. So we applied for that 
and received the funding so we could begin the gardening program. They began to provide spaces for kids to play and received the additional funding to be able to build a playground. But these things wouldn't have happened if they hadn't had a strategy and begun working together and looking for how they could make these things happen. The biggest thing that they needed was the Park Plaza Storm Shelter. And by the end of 2018, that vision was also a reality. So this is just an example of the possibility when people come together and get the support that they need from organizations like Rock USA and the North Country Collaborative Foundation, and then with a little additional coordination around a strategy, begin bringing in willing partners from the community to assist them in helping make their strategy a reality. So that gives you an example of the kind of content that we're sharing in these deep dive days. And so I'm going to take you to the website just real quick because we want to wrap up here. Um, but the housing solution summit.com goes into the schedules for each of the deep dive days, the speakers, it's got kind of welcome videos, and it has these content preview webinars. These are recordings that go into a, a more, little more detailed story than I did on each one of the deep dive days, including the preview day coming up for the deep dive day number four. Um, we have different passes that people can get. Um, they have different ways of getting an all community, all access pass or individual passes. Um, each one of these is separate or you can get a pass for all of them. And what we really want though is for like the United Way, the mayor's office, the hospital to come together and um, choose to get their passes. And I'm just gonna show, we've tried to make it very affordable. We have a free sample pass that lets you just get any one um, session, which is people get a little frustrated because they'll listen to one and they're like, now it says I'm locked out of the sessions. Well, it only allows you to get one, but we have one day passes. We have individual all day access passes that would give you a bunch of additional benefits. But what we're really hoping for is to talk to your community partners, have them see some of these webinars and have them get an all community, all access pass which is a coupon for up to 100 people to attend for free at no cost. And this is for all five days, um, 100 people. So then you, you can invite people from the faith communities, from others, and they don't have to pay anything, but they can come together. But, but we're trying to keep this as economical as we can, but still we don't have any sponsors and we need, it takes a lot of work to put these things together. So we're trying to get a lot of volume. So spread the word about the Housing Solutions Summit with your local government leaders, your homeless coalitions, your health departments, then participate and see how you can help do these things that, that remove the obstacles that would otherwise be there. And as I mentioned, it's likely that in next year, there will be money starting to come available from the Housing Supply and Affordability Act that will help hundreds and hundreds of communities get funding to put together strategies and plans to change their zoning and various things. Because the, the, this bill, and Amy Klobuchar is one of the sponsors, um, said that, you know, recognizes that communities have to get together, fix zoning, fix coding, work on financing, bring people together, and that takes time and money. So this gives money in these uh, competitive grants, but they're, they're planning $300 million a year. So there will be lots of these grants, but you still have to you know, apply for them. And so participating in the Housing Solutions Summit is a great way to really help your community change the ecosystem and the environment. Um, so the question is, so I, we only have just uh, about two minutes here to kind of wrap up. Um, and we will send out an email. I believe we can get that to everyone who registered with the recording and with some of the answers to questions. So if you type in questions, um, you try to get to some of them. So the question is, how is this done with a housing first model? Um, in San Antonio, housing first dictates many of our housing solutions. 
So a lot of what we're recommending are things that are outside the typical HUD funded response to homelessness. We're trying to deal with the things that oftentimes the current programs don't fund, like the safe car parking, like some of the, the other care coordination things, like some of the home sharing, or some of the broader ecosystem of how can we reduce the cost of certain things to, to help people through. So we do have multiple sessions on housing first and how to do them better, how to add things in. Um, but we're sort of taking a more holistic system approach rather than just how do we um, work within the HUD programs, housing, urban, and development. But we want to we want to help complement those. Um, Thank you, Bill and Phil. And as Bill said, we will, we will get some of these additional answers to you as we send through um, the recording and answers to your questions. So very informative, lots for you to think about. And you can also pick up those deeper dives uh, with the recording. So thank everybody for participating. We will make sure we download the chat to see where those questions are. You can put your questions in there and um, appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, you will get a copy of the video. You will get a copy of the video. Thanks everybody for participating.